these uh, sessions have been going on since uh, the first open CNU uh, a long time ago, much longer than I'd like to recognize. And each of these topics, as those of you who have been in the earlier sessions know, you could do a week and a half on them to do them justice. I'm going to attempt to roll through very quickly so that we can, you can ask questions about the issues that are uh, burning up your brain. First, with the market, there's a difference between who we think we are and who we actually are. When we listen to pundits on television and politicians giving their pitches, we still think of ourselves as this nuclear family, Ozzy and Harriet. Is anyone here old enough to have seen this on television? Okay, well then you know Ozzy and Harriet lived in this house in the Hollywood Hills, which recently resold for five and a half million dollars. Uh, that house that we're still building lots of, 62% of U.S. dwellings, are designed for the traditional American family. Now, if you use the, the standard definition of the traditional American family, where Ozzy went to work and Harriet stayed home, and their children were a rock star and a circus performer, um, that is now only 7.9% of U.S. households, a pitiful minority, hardly worth a niche market perspective. And yet we're designing houses still, at least in their neighborhood form, for this type of household. Now we know since the 1970s, women entered the workforce in increasing numbers, the dual income household is now the norm. So when we look at just married couples with children, we're at about 22% of all U.S. households. Still below the majority it was in the 1960s when the baby boom was, uh, were babies. Female head of household, 8.5% of all U.S. households. Male head of household, or something that was, uh, was a rounding error when I was a kid, 2.8% of U.S. households. Now this is a chart that Lori and I put together in 2003 that has, I think we've shown in every pre or most presentations since then. What it does is it looks at uh, two age cohorts, 20 to 29, which oddly enough are the gray bars, for those of you who can distinguish color, um, and 50 to 59 are the blue bars, mainly because at the time we put that together, that's how old we were. It is a convergence that these two age groups who have the most propensity to be concerned about the public realm, to want to be involved with community. The young folks just starting out and the older folks having uh, divested themselves of their uh, resident children, or so we thought. And uh, well, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But this is the fundamental support for walkable neighborhoods, this convergence of the two largest generations in American history. The baby boomers uh, born 46 to 64, currently uh, a little over 700, uh, 75 million. They were born, uh, they age now 51 to 69, uh, and we look at their impact on age-related institutions. Uh, I was the first baby boomer. My mother tells me I was born nine months and 20 minutes after the Japanese surrendered. And having a last name that starts with Z and being tall for my age, I w no matter whether they lined up alphabetically or by height, I was always the last guy. Uh, so there wasn't a chair for me in kindergarten, and uh, there wasn't uh, a place for me at uh, my university of choice, and so on down the line. Um, and I'm, I wonder, actually, starting in the, in the uh, early 20s, whether there will be enough uh, cemetery plots or uh, crematoria. For those of you who invest long from uh, 2026 to 2054, uh, birth, uh, death is going to be a big industry. 
But right now, uh, we are empty nesting and in retirement, or what we call retirement, which is actually second, third, fourth career. Boomers, still the me generation, supposedly headed for retirement, more likely to be owners than, than renters, politically and spiritually quite diverse, as we can see from our political debate nationally, and the new old, which is, as I gain in years, I begin to understand the concept of the new, new old. What we like, golf, tennis, uh, gardening, the theater, culture, volunteering. What we don't like are 14-year-old boys on skateboards. <laughs> Smokers, uh, aging, retirement, and of course, the big D. The second, when we first started giving this presentation about the convergence, the demographic imperative for urbanism, this was the second largest generation in American history the millennials, but in 2010, they passed the boomers. They're now at 86 million and are going to be influencing us for a long time. I've, I've made a career understanding the baby boomers because for most of my working life, they've been in the driver's seat. They, uh, if they haven't been in the driver's seat, they've been influencing everything culturally, economically, politically. The time has come for the millennials to take over. Now, those of you who are in Gen X are saying, well, what about me? Well, this was a, a colossal cosmic joke on the part of the demographers who, call, who uh, get to call the, the generations. Generation X is only about 10 years long, and it was during a low period of, of birth rates. And the demographers will say, well, the last year of the boom, 64, was the last year there were four million live births in America. So we cut it off there, made sense. The first year of the millennials, 1977, first year live births went over four million. So that's the beginning of the millennials. So Gen X, I, I, I don't know what Gen X did to demographers to warrant having the, not only the smallest generation in American history, but the shortest generation in American history. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about them later because right now they are uh, the market in, in, in for sale housing at the very least. Looking at this even larger pig in the python, does everybody, is there anyone who does not get the reference of a pig in a python? Just raise your hand. Just, um, when a um, constrictor uh, kills its prey, it swallows it whole, and the pattern on the back of the python or other constrictor is distorted as this pig passes unceremoniously through the alimentary canal of the uh, python. So in this analogy, the pig is the generation. The pattern on the back of the python are age-related institutions. This big demographic cohort, first the boomers, now the larger demographic cohort, the millennials, has a dramatic impact on every age-related institution as it moves through its life cycle. So here we have the life cycles for the millennials, and there the, the, you see question marks. Enter the job market, you know, we're not sure. Married with children, we're even less sure. And, and this is what I'm going to end with are these unanswered questions about what this huge generation is going to do. Look at age at first marriage. Men are now 25% older at, at their first marriage than they were in 1960. Women fully a third, 33% older at first marriage. Now, the boomers were fabulous at delaying marriage. And, de and delaying childbirth. Um, millennia of Gen X did the same thing. Millennials have upped the ante dramatically. They are mostly single, highly social, ethnically and culturally diverse, the first generation in American history where whites are no longer a majority. Early unsettled career, largely because of their age, but remember the oldest millennial is now 38 years old. They're more likely to be renters, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. 
They are very mobile, uh, a group where it is normal to decide what city they want to live in and worry about how they're going to get a job after they move there, as opposed to predecessor generations who are all about job location and relocation. And they are green, and they are sensitive to greenwashing. They will not accept the kind of BS that you see all over uh, the marketing world. You see the guy in the upper right-hand corner? He is so green, he takes his park with him wherever he goes. <laughs> what they like, this is a little convergence, the great convergence. They like museums, they like yoga, and wor uh, other things that I can't pronounce. Um, music clubs, uh, cycling. Uh, they don't much care for hunting. They do like the dog. Fishing, not so much. NASCAR, forget about it. Golf, even more so. And uh, driving, mm -mm, no, not into it. And we'll get back into that a little bit later as well. The two largest generations in American history, one's post-family, one's pre-family, so naturally they're largely one and two person households to the point where now 60% of American households have just one or two people in them. Um, two thirds of home buyers are singles or couples. We got the, the guy, eight to 12% of home purchases made by single men. Uh, and I want you to look carefully at the decorating options here. <laughs> now some of those men are gay men, this clearly is not. Um, 16 to 24 percent of home purchases made by single women, and I con con contrast uh, the dog guy with uh, Chintz girl up there in the upper left-hand corner. Now, understand, these are people of all ages, and, and female uh, buyers, single includes divorced, um, separated, widowed. 30 to 32 percent of home purchases made by couples without children. And couples, as you can see from these photos of every stripe, gay couples, straight couples, interracial couples. And then the big one, this is where Generation X is, is flexing its muscle, 35 to 37% by traditional and non-traditional families. Non-traditional families largely being single head of household and most of them are female head of household. But you have all these variations. You have what census calls other family, which is two sisters living together. It's the grand family where grandparents are raising their grandchildren, which for the most part is, par is, is part of this tragedy that has been occurring in our country for, for so long uh, in the inner cities. So, we have this housing stock, 62 plus percent single family detached houses in a market dominated by singles and couples. Then you have the evolving neighborhood preferences. There was a uh, study done in 2004 for the National Association of Realtors, one of the first really well conceived study uh, that did not have confirmation bias baked into it where there was a very strong and clear comparison of what they were talking about in a compact, pedestrian-oriented, walkable, mixed-use neighborhoods compared to the auto-driven, isolated, separated neighborhoods that are m more the norm. 55% preferred walkable urbanism over a place where you needed to drive for your daily needs. The same firm for NAR redid that study in 2011 and found roughly the same results, 56 percent, a little bit more. The National Association of Realtors did another study using the same set of questions but a slightly different methodology, so is it methodological differences that went from 56 to 60 percent or truly a, uh, a sea change, uh, we don't know. We do know that a fourth independent study um, done by the first firm, but for a different client, found that 62% of millennials prefer 
walkable urbanism to the conventional auto oriented form now the millennials are going to dominate the nation much after I'm in the grave. You, you can't see this, I'm sure, but it's 2014 to 2045. And unlike the other dramatic uh, convergence graph, this runs from zero to the top line is uh, 90 million. The green bar are the millennials. The white bar that uh, looks like a ski slope, is our, uh, that's us, the, 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 uh, uh, the boomers. And then Gen X, which begins to tail off uh, in the last quarter of the, uh, of the chart, are the orange bars. Now, millennials have got staying power because they um, are bolstered by my immigration. 17% of millennials are foreign born. Now, the millennials are at an age, the leading edge of the millennials are at an age where they should be, according to historic norms, feeding the bottom of the housing, the ownership housing chain. Those first time buyers that buy a house from the move up buyers who move up and buy a house from the move down buyer who then buys a small house or splits that uh, a small house to another house in a in a warmer or, um, or, or better, uh, more attractive location. First time buyers are not really where they should be. They're at 33% now. And these of course are largely uh, millennials, um, as opposed to 50% during the time when liar's loans were the norm and that 50% that is, is, uh, is tw no, I'm sorry. I'm it's a, it's a, it was a, not only a liar's loan, but a, but a lie. 2010 was when that, that brief uh, support from the federal government for first-time home ownership kicked in. And clearly, the economists will tell you that when, when uh, or um, conservative economists will tell you that when the government intervenes, it will oftentimes borrow economic activity from the future. And this graph would tend to support that notion that folks who might have bought in 2011, bought in 2010 to get under the, the, the uh, guideline, uh, the deadline. Um, so, uh, but I'm not a conservative economist, so I'm not gonna make that case. Millennial home ownership is, uh, now this is, a, this is a chart that runs from 13% to 17.5%, and the peak year was 2004, uh, 2005, and that was where I was supposed to be talking about liar's loans, where you really did not to have uh, a verifiable income in order to get a mortgage. We're down to a very low uh, percentage of uh, folks in the millennial, 18 to 34 year olds, which is the core of the millennial generation who are homeowners. And we're not sure actually what's gonna happen with this generation for a number of reasons. They are loaded with student debt, uh, famously over a trillion and 11 and a half percent uh, delinquent or in default. Uh, the, it is the loan instrument that has the highest default rate of any of the, the instruments, surpassed credit card debt a few years ago. And uh, you need to look at these data very carefully because if you peel it back, you find that there is a significant chunk of it that is for relatively unsophisticated students who have been trapped by uh, for-profit uh, institutions of higher education. Uh, there is also the, uh, a, a piece that gets well publicized of folks who have advanced degrees and, ha and are saddled with student debt as well. But a, 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 an alarming percentage of this, and I don't have the actual numbers, but I, last time I saw them, it was really alarming, are folks who went to some university of, of uh, XYZ online or in person, for profit, not the one that just shut down, but I'll bet that's, uh, that's probably a piece of it, and uh, came away without a degree. 
All they got was student debt. So the home ownership rate, it was chugging along in around 64% for uh, a long, long time. Then you had the, uh, the, the Clinton surge, the focus on home ownership, and, and uh, the, the Bush continued that. And uh, then you had the crash, and now we're down back to normal, we think, maybe, 64%. This is part of a pattern that we're seeing of a move away from the ownership society to the sharing society, which for someone my age is virtually incomprehensible, because when I have something, I want to own it. But not so much the younger generation. I'll get, to get back to that, or maybe not. Maybe I'll just talk about it right now. Um, one of the trends, significant trends, obviously, is, is toward urbanism in, in our very largest cities, where the revitalization, urban revitalization got a real head start on second tier, third, third tier cities. The cities that are most notable, like New York and San Francisco, costs have always been very high. Um, there is a movement toward smaller units, even micro units, which we can talk about if anyone has a burning desire to do that. But one of the th things that makes micro units work is the difference of the size and shape and amount of stuff that young people have. They don't have furniture, nor do they want their parents' furniture. <laughs> if, if, if you are an antique dealer, you have a shop that is loaded with what they call brown goods. Those Duncan Fife dining sets from the late 18th century, can't give them away. Footprint. Think about the TV you had when you were 20 and the footprint that took up. Think about the footprint the TV, if they have a TV, it hangs on the wall. And a very high percentage of millennials don't have time for television. If they want to see the, the, the latest music imitation that Jimmy Fallon did, it's a clip, it's available on Fallon Online, as is the Daily Show, as is reruns of Colbert, um, Scandal, whatever. It's all available online. Um, some of it actually legally, which is important <laughs> for a percentage of. Um, there used to be things called compact discs. There used to be things called books. All of these things now reside right here. It's, it is amazing. So the, all of those things that used to take up footprint, stuff, no longer necessary. And the idea of owning, not as important to this generation. Now, I am painting with a very broad brush. There are millennials, and because it's such a huge generation, there's a whole lot of millennials that want a muscle car, they want a giant projection TV, they're collecting all of the Marvel comics in original. Um, what else? They have, uh, they have a vinyl collection par excellence. Um, actually, these are overlapping groups because the muscle car and the vinyl people do not, they do not intersect. But <laughs> nevertheless, there are subgroups. But as a whole, the direction of this generation is I don't need stuff. Lori and I run uh, meetings with uh, potential residents. Uh, we don't really call them focus groups because that implies a degree of, of uh, specialization that we don't have. But we basically get them together and talk to them. And it's amazing. They, you know, they don't want cars. Again, they do that same gesture I just did. What do I need a car for? I've got this. Look at this. Um, they, they don't want furniture. They do. Uh, at least one half of them do like closet space, uh, particularly for shoes. So there is that one thing, the clothes. When I was 17, 
I, I, one second after my birthday, I got my learner's permit. Um, there are no more. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of people that still get driver's license, but the, the rate of drivers under 19 uh, or under 25 or under 30 is substantially lower now than it was. And that's quite astonishing when you consider how large this generation is. This is a rate of, an, of a, a larger, uh, larger group. Whoops. So this self-driving car, the, the future, this, this, the internet and the internet of things is, is, going to, is going to assist this generation continue to shed their, the idea that they needed to own things. The self-drive, you can, you can actually be at three or four in the morning, back from the club, completely stoned or drunk out of your mind, and go through a Chipotle drive-through uh, because you're not driving, your car is. This is, this is the future for, of drunks. Um, the, the self-driving car, it's, it's kind of an astonishing thing in and of itself, but when you think about it, there are scores of techno technological pieces that have come out of this and other efforts like it that have been embedded in our vehicles. The self-parking car that works, I don't know, wherever you have a place where you have a parking spot that's a parallel parking spot that's a twice as, or half again as long as your car, which doesn't apply in most of the cities I'm in. Um, but the lane change, the automatic braking, all of those things, they all generated here. So it seems silly to think about the self-driving car, but it is in the future. If you, uh, if you are uh, so inclined to buy a Tesla, the top line model uh, actually has autopilot. It goes, with, and it doesn't obey the speed limit either. It goes with the speed of traffic. And if you uh, press the, the turn indicator, it's, it says, okay, you wanna move into the next lane? Okay, taken care of, done. That's now. Now this mode of transportation is growing uh, dramatically. I have commutation details that uh, I'll show in the next slide. This is one of my favorite slides for the future. This woman is riding a, a, a beautiful uh, antique bike in high heels uh, with no helmet, with her ball and chain riding pinion on the, on the, on the back. To me, this single image is the future of America. Millennial women, much higher rate of bachelor's degrees, much higher rate of master's degrees. They now are 1% higher in doctorate degrees. They, they obviously still have a long way to go in, in, in terms of equality of pay, but that is changing if you look at the higher echelons of, of, uh, of jobs. It's the, the pink collar that is really, as always, uh, not, not uh, getting equity. So think, when you think about the future, think about this image of, of this young woman in her, cycling in her high heels. The commutation by bicycle, it has, uh, it's increased dramatically. Uh, Bike-friendly cities is something that's given out by an organization uh, whose name I unfortunately forget, but uh, probably to avoid a lawsuit because it doesn't take much to get to be bike-friendly. This is the thing, though, the two, two feet, and this is a picture I took in Kansas City back in the 90s, maybe early, early aughts. Two feet from everything exciting in the city. It's the walkability and the support of realistic transit that will make the difference. This is where the millennials so far have gravitated and where their parents, uh, the boomers, have gone in large numbers as well. So there are a whole bunch of questions that 
need to be answered. Will the millennials stay in urban neighborhoods when they have children? This is the last, next to the last slide. Um, the question of when they're going to have children, before we, before we pose this question, when are they going to have children? Fertility rates are at their all-time low. They have never, ever been lower in this country. And there are some academic demographers who believe that the depressing effect of the Great Recession, which is, the, uh, the fertility rate is, always runs counter to uh, economic activity in America, always has. Uh, but there's usually a rebound, you know, that sort of happy days are here again, baby boom lit. Um, it hasn't happened yet. In fact, it is, it's, the, the fertility rate has continued to drop, particularly among women in their 20s. Now, this is part of a phenomenon of delayed marriage, delayed childbirth, and for a very significant minority of millennials, probably a, a, a plurality if you break it out, who that it's not marriage and childbirth, it's childbirth and marriage. So will the millennials stay in urban neighborhoods when they have children? They will be more likely to stay than predecessor generations. The Gen Xers who are in those mature urban neighborhoods have already made that commitment. They are staying, they are fighting with the schools. One of the one of the metrics for good performing schools is high degree of parental involvement, and uh, they are involved in a high degree. Here you see the uh, just sort of the tip of the iceberg of the hipster stroller wars that continue in Brooklyn. Um, but walkable neighborhoods at every scale, and that includes the other end of the of the transect, the T3 or whatever, the new neighborhoods. This is Norton Commons in uh, outside of uh, outside of Louisville. There are neighborhoods like this in all of our great cities too, that are walkable to uh, places of commerce, places of entertainment. So we believe pretty strongly that the uh, millennials will continue to stay in those neighborhoods, in, in some of those groups that we gather, asking them about their long term, there's a small minority, but a vocal minority, who are actually quite angry about having been raised in the suburbs, the perfected suburbs of the 70s, where all the grass grows in the same direction, and it's a rite of passage to move beyond your cul-de-sac on foot or on two wheels where every date is, is, every playing opportunity is arranged and organized, and until you turn 16 or 17, you are a hostage to someone with a driver's license, um, which in the worst case is an older sibling. Those people are really angry about that upbringing and say they would never subject their children to that kind of upbringing. So we will see. I will end with this quote from Holly White, what attracts people most, it would appear, is other people. We're constantly asked about, is there a limit to how much housing you could put in my downtown or in my suburban, walkable suburban center? And uh, I believe, absent any other metrics, the answer is no. The more people you have, the more people will want to be there. 